Hi, and welcome to FBC Lloyd's YouTube channel. It's our hope that God will speak to you through the message that you're about to watch. If you'd like to know more about our church, you can check us out online at www.fbclloyd.ca or you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. If you have an Apple, Windows, or Android phone, you can download our free mobile app and that'll help you stay connected. Now, here's the latest from FPC. Morning, everyone. A few random things. Um, maybe it's already apparent. I've been fighting a cold this week. And um, so if I go like this, you might want to go like this. Or Aaron might dive for the knobs. Because if I cough, it might, might blow you out of your seats. Um, and I can't be sure, so just be forewarned. Another thing, man, I'm excited, uh, really excited. I, every time I come to church, I learn some things. And today, I learned that Ryan has shaving cream. <laughs> and, uh, you know, which is really cool. I don't know where he uses it. <laughs> so that's sweet. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. So, all right, all right, all right. Okay, so anyways, let's get at this. Um, well, we, we, did anybody happen to see, as we, as we start this morning, did anybody happen to see uh, this documentary that's been on CBC the last number of Saturday nights? Last night it was on the mating rituals of different species and so on. Has anybody seen that just out of interest? Okay, well, don't worry because it has absolutely zero to do with anything today. I was just interested. <laughs> but... But if, if you do go back and look at it, it would, it would lend itself to our first uh, sermon in this series, being all in on God, because it, it just speaks to a designer. Um, the things that some of these animals do in, their, in that whole process is absolutely amazing, and, and there is no rhyme or reason to that other than that is how God made them. Um, so check it out for what it's worth. We're in week three of this all-in series, and... For those of you that are just catching up, maybe those of you that are here for the first time, or maybe you're just checking us out on, online for the first time, and you're seeing all this stuff around with the cards and the dice and the chips and so on, um, no, this isn't a series about gambling. No, this is not our latest fundraising project at FBC. We are actually um, making the contention through this series that people are gambling today with their lives. All around us, people are gambling with their lives. They're going through life hoping that they'll find the things that matter, hoping that they're doing things the right way, hoping that if there is a life after this life, that they've done what's necessary to accomplish that or merit that, that life going forward, or at least the optimum life going forward. And so this morning, given that we're gambling with our lives and we're making that assertion, then in this series we're actually advocating that we not, not gamble on things in life, not go through life just hoping, but rather that we would be certain about where we're at, what we're doing, because the stakes are that high when we gamble with our lives. So in week one, we talked about going all in on God, being all in on a designer. And then in week two, last week, Ryan came and he talked to us about going all in on the church, which is to say one of the things that God has designed for us, being all in on that, because as we engage with the church, and as Ryan pointed out, we're, we're built like Lego to connect with one another. And within the context of the church, then we can come together and we can support one another. We can help one another. We can maximize our highs. We can minimize the lows as, that we encounter as we go through life. And so we're designed to do life in community. And so Ryan talked about that last week. And then this week, we're talking about being all in on our community. Now, I don't know how it works in your household, but at the Villa Bainton, every once in a while, we have a family meeting. We have them for different reasons. Sometimes it's because we've got something that's really cool going on and we want everybody to hear about it at the same time. Sometimes it's because there's something new coming up and there's going to be a changing direction that we're going through or whatever and we want everybody to be up to speed. Sometimes it's because we drift. We start to lose a little bit of touch to the things that we're supposed to be doing as a family, the way we should be operating. And so this morning, if you're visiting with us, 
And then particularly if you're visiting with us and you're not at that point yet where you would call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, where you would say that you believe in God and that you're following Him with your li- lives, then just heads up, this is going to be sort of an FBC family meeting where we're going to talk about where we've drifted a little bit. And so please bear with us through that. Um, and understand this morning, I, I hope that you'll understand and that you'll realize even by the end that I'm calling this meeting, so to speak, because of you, with you in mind. Maybe you've been beat up a little bit by a church. Maybe you feel abused by some Christians out there. You've had some experience in your past that hasn't been optimum or positive. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And maybe, maybe some of the reasons that you've encountered that sort of an experience. So please bear with us as we go forward, as we dive in. When you look at your Bibles, in very short order, you're going to see that Christ was all in on his community. He went all in on the world. He came here. And beyond that, he spent time with people. He was focused on people. He cared about them. He invested his life in them. He spent time with them. He loved them. He was all in. And so it should come as no surprise to us that he then has told us to be all in on our community. That is the instruction that he left us with. In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus commissioned us to go into all the world and tell people about him and what he has done for them. Then in John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. Between those two things then, between us understanding that Christ came and died for us, paid the penalty of our sins so that we can have life with him, and then understanding that beyond that, then he told us that his command for us is for us to do the same, then we should be all in today on our community. We should be all over that. But I think it's more than fair to say this morning that somewhere along the line, we went off the trail. I would contend this morning that somehow we've lost track of our mission. And that's as positively as I can sum it up. If I was to be more blunt, albeit maybe more accurate, I would say that we've ignored our mission. Or at the very least, we have supplanted it with a mission that we find more palatable. With a mission that we would be more comfortable with that we think is more inclined or in, in keeping with how I'm wired, what makes me tick, where I'm comfortable. And as a result of that, today, I would say that our society is on the brink. We have slid to the precipice of a cultural cliff. And I might even contend that we are not at the precipice, but we are leaning and teetering over the precipice. The thing about that is that we don't know. And some of us might be sitting here this morning and we might be saying, it's too late. And I would say one thing about that. Two things, actually. Number one, I would say, it really doesn't matter. Whether or not we are at the precipice or teetering over the precipice, whether or not it's too late to pull back from the precipice, it doesn't change today what our mission is. Our mission remains the same. And that is, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the world around us. That is our mission. And it doesn't matter where we find ourselves and what state our society is in. Secondly, I would say that to succeed, if there is any hope of us pulling back from the brink, and regardless of whether or not we can accomplish that, we still need God's help. We need Him to be involved with us today in that mission, particularly 
if there is a hope of us pulling back from the brink. So with that in mind, let's pray and then we'll dive in and go. Father, this morning we do need help. And so we come to you this morning and would ask God that you would come and help us today. That you would speak to us. That you would help us to understand where we've gone off the rails. Where we've gone off track. Father, that you would help us then also to course correct. Get back on the mission that you've given to us. So to that end, God, I would ask for your help this morning and I would pray these things in your son's name for his sake alone. Amen. All right. As I said before, somewhere along the way we lost track. I believe that we've gone off the trail. And as a result, our society is in a colossal mess. According to an Angus Reid poll that was reported in McLean's magazine in November of 2009, and these are the most recent Canadian statistics that I could find, in Canada, 22% oppose euthanasia. Similarly, 22% believe that abortion is morally wrong. And yet, 31% in Canada have a moral issue with wearing fur. 22% think that abortion is morally wrong, but 31% of us think that wearing fur is wrong. 41% condemn medical 41% condemn medical testing on animals, while only 17% condemn researchers using human embryonic stem cells. Same-sex relationships are acceptable to two-thirds of Canadians, which was a seven-point jump from the two years previous to that. So from 2007 to 2009, 7% increase of, of Canadians that believe that same-sex relationships are acceptable. Some 87% had no qualms about sexual relationships between unmarried women and men. Divorce is morally acceptable to 84% of the national re respondents and 92% of those living in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, which as an aside, maybe helps us understand how Lloyd Minster can be the second highest subscriber base to the website Ashley Madison in Canada, second only to Toronto. A dubious, dubious distinction for us as a community. Even siring children out of wedlock isn't a moral issue for 79% of Canadians. Prostitution is morally acceptable to, on average, 42% of Canadians. That breaks down, not surprisingly, to 56% of males find that prostitution is all acceptable, and 29% of women. And according to the Chief Public Health Officer's report on the state of public health in Canada, which came out in 2013, the rate of sexually transmitted infections between 2001 and 2010 rose on average by 148%. We're in a mess. And this morning, while I understand that it is important for us to understand the state that we are in and to understand the issues that we are facing as a society, I would contend that it is not where we should be focused. And it's definitely not where we're going to focus this morning. In fact, I would submit that because we have become focused on that, on the issues, that is why we continue to be in the state that we are in. As Christ charged the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, I would say that we have lost our first love. Which is to say that we have lost touch with what Christ has done for us. We've lost that feeling, that, that understanding, that release that we had when we came to Him, when we recognized that we were sinners, that 
we recognized the penalty of our sin, and then we understood what God had done for us, and that we could be released from out, out from underneath that burden. And we would tell people about it because we were just that excited. And we didn't care about anything else other than letting people know that they too can have that gift. But today I would submit that that's become a distant memory for most of us. What I'm saying is that somewhere along the line, I believe that we have become focused on the state of affairs of our society, which is not our problem to solve, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. And we have lost track of the state of affairs of our friends and family, which is the very mission that Christ left us to. In fixating on the problem, I would say that we have then probably naturally started to focus on how we can solve the problem. How we can solve our issues. And to that end, we've employed a number of different tactics. All of which have failed miserably. A few of them would be, one, we set out to elect the right people to solve the problems in our society. We adopted the idea, the, the strategy, that if we can just get the right people in office, then they will be able to make the right laws, which will bring us back in line with where we need to be. That will solve the problems that we face in our society. And it failed miserably because of the exponentially widening gap between those of us that would subscribe to the solutions that we subscribe to under a Judeo-Christian sort of perspective and those that don't subscribe to anything like that at all. So we found that those that we could elect faced a caucus where they were outnumbered. They couldn't affect change if they tried. So failing in that respect, then we looked around and we said, we've got to adopt a different tactic. Let's, let's become an interest group. So as Christians, as the moral majority, we got out there. And we started to lobby government, thinking that, well, we can't put the people in place that we want, so we will pressure government. We will show them that we're a voting block to be contended with, so that they will then somehow adopt our ideas into their perspective. And again, we failed miserably for the exact same reason. That we are dwarfed by interest groups around us that share a far different perspective on life and what they need to, we need to do in our society. We picketed. We protested. All to no avail, other than to give ourselves a bad reputation and name. It hurt us more than it helped us. And so then when we found that that failed, now, today, what do we do? We sit around and we talk about the sad state of our affairs. How our culture is going to hell in a handbasket. And we despair. We predict God's judgment on this society. And we hope for a pre-tribulation rapture so that we can avoid that judgment when it comes. Somewhere along the line, I think it became us versus them. Where us are the Christians. We're the good guys. And them, they're the non-Christians. They're the bad guys. And that's become sort of our perspective as we go into the world every day. Somehow they've become our enemies. And we think they're going to get what they deserve. And how that must break God's heart because it is so twisted from the way that He sees it. In reality, 
They are not our enemies. We have an enemy, but it's not them. And He doesn't want them to get what they deserve. He wants them to find Him so they can be spared just like us what we deserve. You know, and we shouldn't be surprised when they don't subscribe to life the way that we do. When they don't acknowledge God or His design. That's not where they're at. Why would we expect that they would follow our rules when they're not playing our game? This morning, we need to make some huge adjustments in our perspective. Because God's calling us to a whole different way of looking at life. And I think we need to go back to the basics. And so this morning, speaking of basics, let's go back to John 3.16. And let's start with that verse. Maybe the last time you saw it was at a sporting event. And we're going to take a look at it. This verse is chocker block full of valuable information. But this morning, I want to limit us to the first six words. For God so loved the world that He gave His only one and, gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But let's look at those first six words. For God so loved the world. When it said that God so loved the world, he wasn't talking about his creation. He wasn't looking down and saying, well, I love those mountains. Love those deserts. Love the oceans. He was looking at us. He was looking at you and me. And he was saying, I love these people so much. So much. Note that it doesn't say, for God so thought that they had that big a problem. He wasn't focused on the problem. That was not his focus. He was focused on you and me. Romans 5.8 says that, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It was you and me that he saw His love for us is His primary concern. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8, say this. In your relationships with one another, now underline this, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So this is Paul writing to us, saying this is Christ's perspective. This is His mindset. Who, so Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That mindset was Christ's because He loved us that much. That somehow God would decide that we are worth coming to die for. When I look at my life, I don't see that. I don't see what would prompt a God to, to leave everything that He has, where things are perfect, to come and save me. But God's mindset is that we are that valuable. And that I love them that much that I am going to do that. Now I'm not suggesting this morning for a moment that God was unaware of the problem. That He didn't care about the problem. That He wasn't concerned about the problem. In fact, He very definitely knew what the problem was. And he knew that when we chose a sin, we had brought upon ourselves a problem that we 
can fix. And so because of his love for us then, he came to fix it. But it was his love that motivated us, motivated him to send his son. He didn't show up just to solve the problem. So when we choose to place our trust in Jesus Christ and to bring our lives in line with who he is and what he is about, then firstly, he solves our individual problem of sin. That's his primary concern. That's the first thing that he accomplishes. But watch this now. Secondarily, as we go out and do that job, that mission that he sent us to, of sharing him with the world around us, and as more people come to him and understand who he is and what he means to their life, and they accept him, bring their lives in line with him, then look what happens. Then God solves our society's problems. Second Chronicles 7 verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear, then God will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. First, he will forgive our sin because he's focused on us. And secondly, then he will heal our land. Secondly, now this morning, don't hear me saying that we should be unconcerned about the problems that we face as a society. We very definitely should be concerned about the problems that we face as a society. And we should be doing all that we can to stand up for what God espouses and, and uh, subscribes to, and we should be doing everything that we can to, to avoid the things that he doesn't. We should use all of the positions that we've been put in to influence those around us and, and the decision makers and so on and so forth towards those things. However, that is not our primary objective. Our primary objective is to help people find Jesus Christ. Not fix the problems. So with that in mind, as we go all in on our community, love then should become our motivation, it should become our method, and it should be our message. I think this only makes sense. If I come to you and I say, I want to fix you, which I think is the way that the church has come across to people for years now, then is it any wonder that they push back from that? When somebody comes to me and says, Doug, I'm here to fix you. You know what? I've got just enough ego. Fran would tell me I've got way more. But I've got at least enough to say, you know what? Talk to the hand. If you think i got a problem, that's your problem. I am willing to live with my problem just because I don't appreciate the way that you're going about this. And we fail. Or when we come to people and we say, you guys need to shape up so that we can get this place back on track. People are saying, like, according to who? If you think that we're off track, that's your deal, man. It's not my deal. So suck rocks. And when we come to people saying that we need to just tidy things up because it's becoming a mess around here, and we make them feel like there are projects, is it any wonder that they don't respond? Our motivation to go all in on our community is that God saved us from what was rightfully ours to give us something far better that we didn't deserve. His love for us. And out of our love for Him, then we need to go and tell the people around us. 1 John 4, 7-12 says, Dear friends, how am I doing for time? Dear friends, let us love one another, for God come, love comes from God. 
Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 11, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. There's our motivation. So that His love can be made complete in us. So that we can touch the world around us with the message that He sent us to give them. So that they can find Him and escape the consequence of their sin as well. Our method of going all in on our community is love. Matthew 22, 36 to 39 says, Teacher, Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And 39, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I said earlier, I don't want to be fixed. But I love it when people help. Because at the end of the day, I know I've got problems. I've got issues. There's things that I'm facing. And when somebody comes alongside of me and says, hey, can I help you? Is there something that I can do? That's a whole different response when somebody cares that much. So we need to go back to that. We need to go back to where we come alongside people and help them, not fix them. Where we come alongside and we try and get to know them, not just make them a project. And our message as we go all in on our community is that God loves us all. Ephesians 2, 4. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, sent His Son to die in our place so that when we place our faith and trust in Him, then we can have eternal life together with Him. That's the message that we need to be giving. Not that this place has to be tidied up. Really quickly, how do, what does that look like? What does that picture look like? What am, I, what am I telling us and commissioning us to? What is the image that we have for what God has commissioned us to? This week, one of the ladies uh, from the church here um, happened to be at the hospital. And as I understand it, um, in the process of her visit there, she came across somebody that was obviously distraught, visibly upset. And the temptation would have been for her to walk by, to leave that alone, to mind her own business. But instead, as I understand it, she engaged with that person and went up and said, hey, what's up? You're obviously upset. Is there something that I can do? Which led to a conversation. And in the process of that conversation, then this other lady mentioned that she felt like she needed to talk to a, a pastor. Or that would be of um, help to her. And so through that, then Ryan and Talisi were able to go and meet with this lady. And I don't know where that goes from here. That's God's deal. But what I do know is that somebody stepped out, came alongside, cared and loved them enough to ask a question, is there something that I can do? That's what we're talking about. That's what I mean today.
If you're here this morning and you're not a Christ follower and you've been beat up somewhere along the way, I apologize. Maybe it's by another church, but maybe it's been by this church. Maybe it's been by me, someone else. I'm sorry for that. I hope that you'll give us another shot. Because the stakes are so high. As we close this morning, three questions. Ask yourself, are you more concerned today about the state of affairs in our society or about the state of affairs for our friends and family? Are you more worried about the issues that we're facing right now, the way that we're going off the tracks? Or does what really preoccupy you is where our friends and family are at in their relationship with God and for eternity? Number two, have you lost your first love? Is your love for God And what he's done for us, sort of on simmer, is it some sort of an investment that you've parked somewhere in the bank, hoping that it will pay dividends and understanding that it will pay dividends one day? Or is it something that burns alive within you today and motivates you to go out and do the mission that he's called us to? Number three. Who can you show Christ's love to this week? It's not too late to change course, to adjust our perspective. In fact, I would beg and plead with you to do that starting this week because somewhere in your world, somewhere somewhere in your midst, wherever God has placed you, there is someone else that needs His love today. And He's put you there with a mission to share His love with them so that He can do for them what they can't do for themselves and solve that individual problem of sin. And so that He, as we do that over and over, will one day be able to do what we can do for ourselves and solve the society's issues that we see and experience today, so that He can solve and heal the problems of our land. Let's pray. Father God, forgive us for twisting Your perspective around to suit ourselves, for our indifference, our ignorance, whatever it is, God, Just our outright rebellion. Forgive us. Help us to find again your perspective. And help us to pursue it. Because the stakes are so high in the state of affairs of our friends and family. God, help us today to go all in on our community. Because of who you are, what you've done for us. And to that end, I pray all of these things in your son's name and for his sake alone. Amen.